Good morning. I <clears throat> uh, hope all of you are looking forward to a good Thanksgiving when you can get together with family and friends and and just have a, a great time, a time of, of being thankful to God for for everything that he's done for us. Uh, today's lesson is <clears throat> uh, a story about Moses uh, and a, a meeting with his father-in-law. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure that everyone is familiar with the phrase, a marriage made in heaven. People find the perfect mates and then plan to live lives of bliss and perfect contentment. Then the holiday season arrives and the question of which set of in-laws will be visited on Thanksgiving and which set will be visited on Christmas. Or do we have a midday dinner with one side of the family and an evening dinner with the other? Well, you probably remember your first meeting with your future in-laws. How do you make a good impression when your intent is to remove your loved one from the family of his or her childhood? It was surely easier in earlier times when one could offer a herd of sheep or cattle to make the separation more of a practical business decision. And future meetings with the in-laws wouldn't be so awkward because the conversation would center around how the herds were progressing and how many grandchildren would be arriving to carry on the family enterprise. Well, our lesson today begins with a family reunion of sorts. It opens with some bits of information that have mystified biblical scholars for centuries. Nowhere in the scriptures are we told when or why Moses had sent his wife and sons back to Jethro, his father-in-law. We do know that his wife had accompanied Moses when he was returning to Egypt to confront Pharaoh and demand that the Israelites be set free. We are also told in chapter 4 of Exodus that en route to Egypt, there had been a problem and Moses' life was in jeopardy. And there could possibly have been a breach of faith on his part. The circumcision requirement for his sons had not been honored. And some scholars surmise that this could have created friction between Moses and Zipporah, his wife. We're told that she conducted the circumcision of her sons and Moses' life was spared. We don't know if this spurred her return to Jethro or if Moses sent her back later to spare some of the hardships he and the Israelites would be facing. It could also be that she had been accompanying him and only went to visit Jethro with her two sons during the wilderness journey when they were in the proximity of Jethro's estate. Whatever the situation was, we know that she and the two sons accompanied Jethro when he came to meet Moses at the Israelite encampment. Let's look at Exodus. It starts with verse 1 and then skips to uh, verse, verses 13 through 27. Jethro... Midian's priest and Moses' father-in-law heard about everything that God had done for Moses and for God's people Israel, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. The next day, this is beginning with verse 13 now, the next day Moses sat as a judge for the people while the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What's this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people are standing around and standing around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When a conflict arises between them, they come to me, and I judge between the two of them. 
I also teach them God's regulations and instructions. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing isn't good. You will end up totally wearing yourself out, both you and these people who are with you. The work is too difficult for you. You can't do it alone. Now listen to me and let me give you some advice. And may God be with you. Your role should be to represent the people before God. You should bring their disputes before God yourself. Explain the regulations and instructions to them. Let them know the way they are supposed to go and the things they are supposed to do. But you should also look among all the people for capable persons who respect God. They should be trustworthy and not corrupt. Set these people over the people as officers of groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. They should bring every major dispute to you, but they should decide all the minor cases themselves. This will be much easier for you, and they will share your load. If you do this and God directs you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will be able to go back to their homes much happier. Moses listened to his father-in-law's suggestions and did everything he had said. Moses chose capable persons from all Israel and set them as leaders over the people, as officers over the groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They acted as judges for the people at all times. They would refer the hard cases to Moses, but all the minor cases they decided themselves. Then Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law, and Jethro went back to his own country. Jethro greeted Moses as a proud father-in-law who recognized that God had, had impacted Moses and enabled him to free the Israelites. He had heard of the miraculous exit from Egypt, and he revealed pride in Moses' leadership and his devotion to God. He was even led to bring sacrifices to Israel's God when Moses detailed the events to him and he voiced praise to the Lord who revealed superiority to all other gods. Then he joined Moses, Aaron, and the elders of Israel in sharing a meal of thanksgiving. The next day, Jethro observed Moses assuming his daily role of leadership as he sat before his people when they brought him their questions and ask him to resolve problems or disputes among one another. He saw Moses trying to pacify each one and to give them instructions, share interpretation of God's laws, and provide them with advice about improving their situation and their relationship with God. As an outside observer, Jethro could be objective about the everyday practices and responsibilities that Moses had accepted as his role of leadership. The trivial nature of some of the problems seemed to occupy far too much time when more pressing matters could be waiting. Moses had grown into adulthood without a true father figure in his life, and now he seemed to allow Jethro to assume that role. Jethro had witnessed Moses being consumed by a workload that was overwhelming. So he asked Moses to perhaps consider sharing some of his day-to-day -day responsibilities. He knew that Moses, as the tribal leader, had to rule on the most significant cases, but some of the petty squabbles and disagreements could just as easily be settled by a third-party representative acting as an intermediary for Moses. Jethro therefore advised the appointment of trusted officials that were capable to serve Moses and, and their peers. Moses could remain as the principal overseer and could better fulfill his duties as the teacher and the guide for the nation. Some people could have seen this as a father-in-law overstepping his role. 
but Moses was thankful for the practical wisdom he had shared. He immediately began to appoint capable representatives to lead the people and to officiate over minor cases while the difficult problems would remain subject to his judgment. When this set of procedures was in place, he said his farewells to his father-in-law who returned to his home country. He had left Moses with a greater opportunity, not merely to lead his people, but also to offer them the chance to develop their leadership potential. You know, my father-in-law was one of the finest men I've ever known. He was a builder who had earned a reputation for the quality of his work as well as for his honesty and integrity. He often lamented the fact that he was unable to receive a high school diploma because he had had to drop out of uh, school to work in the fields, doing farm work to help support his parents and brothers and sisters. And while he didn't have a framed diploma to attest to his knowledge, I saw him correct the mistake of architects who had misfigured weight supports for massive buildings. I also saw evidence of his scholarly understanding of the scriptures. And more importantly, I saw him emulating the teachings of Jesus in his daily interactions with others. In later years, when much of the physical labor had to be delegated, there were some regrets. Job foremen had to be appointed to supervise the work. And because they had been trained by a skillful craftsmen, they were prepared and the work continued to reflect excellence. Imagine the disciples of Jesus as they took on the responsibility of sharing the message of Jesus to the world. Each of them in turn would delegate responsibilities to others. Later, Paul experienced some hesitancy in delegating, but eventually he counted on younger men such as Mark and Timothy to carry on the ministry. Each generation has continued to allow the light of God's love to be shared with others. The delegation of responsibility must be constant, and Christians need to be prepared to serve and to prepare others to serve. I discovered as a, a coach that a team captain could inspire his teammates and that the senior members of a team could lift and challenge underclassmen to aspire to excellence. You know, just as Jesus delegated his disciples to make disciples of all nations, we should follow that example. Simply by sharing God's love with a neighbor is a step forward. And that person can encourage another neighbor. The church, being the church, is a team effort. People may be eagerly waiting to do their part if they're given the foundation and the opportunity to serve. We need to work together to allow each person a chance to use his or her talent in God's service. May we pray together. Dear God, while we as church members come from various backgrounds and experiences, we know that we can be unified in sharing your love with others. Help us to work as a team to glorify you each day.